Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, uh, I've been unfortunate enough to be given the post after uh, pa uh, post lunch uh, talk, so I guess uh, many of you will be half awake. Um, so before I start, um, my title is uh, on accreditation in medical education: a historical perspective, global, regional, and local. And perhaps I have modified the content, so it may not reflect. Uh, what the title says, but hopefully to a better cause. Before I start, I do feel uh, thrilled and uh, honored, uh, to be honest, uh, to be uh, standing here in front of you all, uh, because Benghazi is the city where I learned medicine. I graduated in uh, 2003 uh, from, uh, at the time, it's called Garyunus University, uh, and so uh, I, am, I am very honored to be here in, uh, in Benghazi. Uh, secondly, I'd like to thank Limu for their, uh, uh, for their opportunity and uh, invitation. Um, uh, and I would also like to congratulate them on uh, such a fantastic uh, program. Uh, programs just on is not just only on lectures, but it's also uh, full of exciting opportunities and uh, symposia, uh, workshops, uh, etc. So uh, fantastic uh, program. And finally, before I start, uh, I would also like to extend my congratulations to Tripoli uh, College because they have uh, only recently uh, have uh, <coughs> successfully completed their accreditation on their program. So um, uh, 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 I was there as part of the uh, accreditation uh, committee uh, representing the General Healthcare Council, uh, as I do work in the General Healthcare Council. And I think Dr. Brahim Sharif is around here somewhere. Uh, he's our um, newly appointed boss. Um, I haven't met him yet. Um, and we uh, obviously uh, have had the pleasure of working with the uh, National Center for Quality uh, Accreditation, for Quality Assurance and Accreditation. I think Dr. Abdullah Abjlil and uh, Dr. Abdelmajid are here also to represent the center. Um, I think they've skipped this lecture for some reason. No, it's all. Hmm? For no, they have another commitment. Oh, they have another commitment? Yes. Okay. Um, I think this is going to be a very uh, cumbersome lecture to go through. Does this work? Where is the turn on? Oh, it's here. So, um, if the... Um, if my voice is not clear, please tell me. I think it's uh, only responsive with uh, PowerPoint presentations. This is the well, well, it works. So the outline is to try and review history of medical education in ancient times, Islamic civilization and early models of medical education in Europe and America. Uh, I'll try and pinpoint the beginning of co uh, quality standard and accreditation in relation to Flexner's report and the Flexner's revolution. I'll try and sum up some. Uh, I'll, I'll try and sum up the global progress on accreditation efforts, uh, and review the uh, history of accreditation bodies in neighboring countries. I haven't really done that, but uh, in Libya, it's very easy to uh, summarize. Um, if we go back to the uh, very, very old times, um, this is the uh, picture of the Hippocratic Oath, our Qasim al-Abuqrati. Um, uh, that comes from the time of ancient Greeks. Uh, we're talking about <clears throat> more than 2,000 years ago. Um, and let's go through it. <clears throat> I've underlined the important bits that are related to, um, uh, related to medical education. Obviously, Hippocratic Oath is not just re in, uh, related to medical education. It's also to do with other practices uh, and, and ethics. Um, so the part related to us uh, reads as follows. To hold... Uh, to hold him who taught me this art equally dear to me as my parents, to be a partner in life with him and to fulfill his needs when required, to look upon his offsprings as equals to my own siblings and to teach them this art if they shall wish to learn it without fee or contract, and that by the set rules, lectures and every other mode of instruction, I will impart a knowledge of the art to my own sons and those of my teachers and to students bound by this contract and having sworn this oath to the law of medicine, but not to others. Um, so uh, I've highlighted these, uh, these lines, basically. Um, there's no point of using that. Um, 
So, so th there's a lot of, if we go back to the ancient times, there's, there's, there's a lot of emphasis on medical education. Uh, and it's not just a downslide um, contract, it's also the feeling of obligation towards your teachers. So it's a it's a it's a it's a, a, a pretty much mutual um, uh, relationship, um, and in the bottom line, where it says, "But no, but but to no others." So basically, uh, and and that's that's relatively controversial if we want to go deep into it. Basically, it means that I shall not give any education to anyone who is not committed to the oath, and if we apply that to our uh, local circumstances, it, may, it might also exclude many of other trainees, either undergraduate or postgraduate. But let's not get into these uh, controversial issues. Um, if we go, by, uh, if we go uh, a little bit further, Islamic civilization area, this is a picture of uh, Ibn Sina, known as Avicenna in the West. Um, but basically, in, in the Islamic civilization area, uh, era, um, um, Teach, we, we, we had teacher doctors, uh, the role of medical education and advancing the art of medicine. Obviously, if you, if you were a medic at the time, if you were a, uh, a doctor at the time, you had to have, you had to have students. Um, uh, students basically lived with their master or mentor or teacher or doctor for long periods until uh, they go back to where they came from uh, once they've been given uh, ijaza or they've been told that they're independent enough. There has been some establishment <laughs> back in the times um, but they're not many, um, and they're far and far, far in between. So if we, if we have Alexandria Medical School, this was not um, a, an actual medical school. It was just a, a group of people, a culture of, of doctors uh, that lived in Alexandria back in uh, Greek or Egyptian uh, periods. Uh, the Academy of Gondishapur, this was in the um, uh, Persian uh, Empire in the third uh, century. Um, and these are the ruins of the uh, uh, of the academy. Uh, it used to be a big building, uh, and then Dar al Hikmah, which uh, was built by the Abbasids in uh, 832. Uh, um, uh, so Dar al Hikmah was basically uh, abolished um, uh, only a few decades after it was uh, established. And uh, obviously, when the uh, uh, Mongols came, they 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 destroyed everything in Baghdad. Um, medical education in the old times, again, this is a picture of uh, um, Jabr ibn Hayyan, who died in eight, uh, 18, uh, sorry, uh, 816. Um, he's very famous for um, having the book of toxins. Uh, Ar-Razi, or Raziz, born in uh, 865. Um, he wrote the book of Al-Hawi, the comprehensive book of medicine, Ibn Sina. Uh, he's, he's also known as uh, Avicenna. I showed a picture of him earlier. Um, um, very famous Kitab uh, al-Qanun or Canon of Medicine. Uh, Ibn al-Haytim is also uh, called as um, al-Hazan. Um, uh, he was an optician, I think. Uh, he wrote a book of optics. Um, if, we, if we come slightly um, to the more recent times, um, uh, basically what uh, Modern, um, in modern times, in, 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 in post-Renaissance or post-Reformation Europe. Uh, Half time. Half time. Yeah, okay. Um, so basically we had, we had two types of doctors. We either had an academic doctor uh, or we had individual practitioners. Now these individual practitioners usually, they usually had uh, um, uh, part-time being a barber and uh, also part-time being a surgeon. And, and this is how um, the practice evolved in Europe. But obviously there was no, there was no standards, there was no structure. Um, and the mode of training, as alluded earlier by one of our speakers today in the morning, um, was basically a pen a apprenticeship. You, you are an apprentice until you're graduated or uh, something like that. Um, you, you did not have to have prior knowledge. You did not have to have had a, a two year or a six month uh, course uh, to, to, to become an apprentice. Now, I've, I've decided to uh, divide my talk into a few um, few eras, and after each era, we will reflect on our current situation. Um, so basically, you didn't have to attend any, um, you, you can attend a few lectures and start practicing medicine, no need to show, show proof of qualification. This happened in Europe in the 16th, 17th, 18th century. 
So basically, you could have no proof of qualification. You can start practicing medicine. Does that reflect on Libya today? I'll leave the question, I'll leave the answers to you. No performance indicators or requirements, no learning objectives whilst you're having your apprenticeship. Um, and this was all prior to the French Revolution in 1789. Um, medical education, early reforms. So this is before even, um, I, this is before the Flexner. I've not come to the Flexner Revolution yet. Post-French Revolution, 1789, Amsterdam syndicate abolished, medical education became a must. And this was only a f in, in a focus uh, in, in, in Europe, but obviously it became more widespread later on. Medicine became an academic affair, need to graduate, but no emphasis on clinical training. In fact, no need for, tra uh, for training whatsoever. So you could have a six month period where you can do academic uh, learning and then you become a doctor, or it may be two years and then you can become, become a doctor. Um, the other problem was that students can take endless number of examinations to pass. You can uh, you can do you can set your exam a hundred times, and once you once once you pass, you're, you're a doctor. There was some laws and de decrees to describe the curriculum, um, but there was no proper content. There was no detail, um, and it was down to you as a as a as a as a teacher. Uh, to decide what you want to teach. In Holland, 1865, the state required a clinical exam before uh, being allowed to practice, and this was the first time. Lessons and reflections, I'll have to go a bit uh, faster. Uh, the state must take over. If the state does not take over, and if there is no state or there is no government, then the situation is hopeless. Clinic and, and this lasted for hundreds of years in Europe. Uh, clinical training, whether it's abused, marginalized, or completely absent, uh, completely absent, has its roots in history. We are not the first ones to do that. Failure to fail, as Dr. Araf Al-Arabi uh, mentioned uh, earlier, cramming failing students. We have hundreds and hundreds, perhaps thousands of, of failing students in our colleges. Detail, we do not detail any, any, any laws uh, whenever we have um, uh, any memorandums or any internal regulations, there is no detail. There's always defects, and mm -hmm. the devil is always in the detail. Leave that to you. Pre Flexner in 1910, the USA in, 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 in before 1910, um, in, until 1810, um, it was all just apprenticeship. Until 1810, there was only three medical schools. It used to be a two or three year program, um, and until the nineteen, until late twenty, uh, until late nineteenth century, it was possible to graduate from medical school without even setting foot in in hospital. So that would have been very easy. There was no structured program or anything. Uh, William Osler um, uh, constructed a. Uh, uh, a a program for postgraduates, but probably later on in his career. Taib, what are the lessons from this, or from that era? A graduate doctor without setting step in hospital. We can say that we do force our students to come to hospital, but I do, many of my, many of my friends have not really done a lot of clinical training and they have passed their exams. And I think this does exist now. Um, postgraduate education. Do we really have a program in Libya? Right, we come to the uh, to Flexner Revolution. Uh, by the way, Flexner or Abraham Flexner was a um, a son of a German uh, or, or German immigrants. Uh, this is how far the Germans have taken over the world now. Um, so he was not a doctor; he was an educationist, uh, and he published in 1910. He published a very damning report. Uh, after he, w he visited 155 schools in the US and Canada. And Booner uh, in 2002 uh, described him as the severest critic and the best friend American medicine ever had. Um, and he concluded that there were too many medical schools. And I would like you guys to reflect on how that reflects here in, 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 on us here in Libya. Um, too many medical schools in the United States and too many doctors were being trained. Um, without going into too much detail about what the recommendations were, well, basically the repercussions and consequences of the Flexner report. Um, so in the United States, there was 160 medical schools in 1920. All came down to 66 because the structures and the standards that he set, um, uh, these many, many medical schools were not able to comply with. So how much time do I have? 
Five minutes. So, so you can see the, the great impact that the Flexi Report has had. And this is only within a few decades, Yanni. How many times? Um, within 15, well, maybe 25 years. And the number of students has halved uh, instead of going up. Uh, so this is an amazing um, piece of work. Uh, let's do some reflections. And, uh, and basically, uh, change must be based on evidence. And obviously, Flexner did go around the, uh, did go around the 155, and he produced, produced a, um, a big piece of evidence. And um, Flexner caused or triggered the, the change, um, but the change was basically driven by legislation. Um, uh, and change is gradual um, uh, and eventual, and it doesn't ha happen overnight. 20th century program structure. Uh, that goes basically to the post-Flexner uh, era. Uh, there, were, uh, there was time where there was no electives, um, and, and that became a problem. Um, Flexner did uh, recommend that medical schools have um, uh, uh, electives in them, um, and he was against the idea of achieving a constant to be fit to practice. Because if you, um, um, and, and, and this idea may not be uh, welcomed by many, um, but uh, basically the, the, the idea is that if you teach the same content to the same number of doctors and uh, you, you expect them to be fit to practice, it may not have the same freedom or academic freedom to students uh, and therefore the outcomes may not be as uh, 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 um, the, the, the outcomes may not be as favorable as you would want them. Um, there was another problem that happened in the, uh, in the 20th century, and that is the explosion of the content, uh, whether in volume, uh, in relevance, uh, or in time. So anything that came up in medical science was basically being crammed into the <laughs> curriculum uh, without much uh, thought of, of whether this is relevant or whether there is a, a good time frame for it. Uh, and then the, 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 the questions, obviously uh, we haven't for this one. I'm going to go through um, a, a very quick list of, of, of some of the accreditation and medical education bodies over the world. Uh, I think the earliest has been the American Medical Association, 1904. And then there was the Liaison Committee for Medical Education, which still stands until today. That was established in 1942. The ACGME, uh, ferocious organization for the, uh, uh, for the graduate medical education. Uh, the World Medical Association was first established in 1947 and it, uh, it published the first report uh, on standards of medical education. And there was the first World Congress for Medical Education it was in London, 1953. And the WFME, which everyone is talking about today, was established in 90, 1972. And this was um, it, it was deemed to be a representative of medical uh, education uh, around the world, and it is part of the World Health Organization, or the WHO. FAMER was established in 2000. Uh, FAMER is um, part of the ACGME, um, I think, so it's, um, it's an American um, institute. Um, in Libya, we have the National Center for Quality Assurance and Accreditation, uh, and this was... Um, uh, this was established in 2010 by a Qanun uh, 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 Lately, the General Healthcare Council, which I work in, uh, was uh, established in 2017. And this is um, only one single slide on the history of accreditation. Um, um, this may not be relevant to the title of our talk, um, but basically, um, uh, the, the evolution of uh, competency versus experience-based training um, may have erupted from a statement by Long in 2000, uh, and it reads as follows. Replace the current approach to residence education, which specifies a fixed number of years in training, with competency-based training in which each resident remains in training until he or she has been shown to have the acquired knowledge and skills and can apply them independently. بمعنى الكلام بالعربي هيك بالفلاجي ان الاكسبيرينس بيس ليرنينج انك انت عباره عن تقعد في فيكست تيرم يعني تقعد خمس سنوات او ست سنوات او ثمانيه سنوات وهو فيكست تيرم وانت تشتغل بغض النظر على الكومبتنسيز بتاعك انت فقط تكمل خمس ست سنوات هذين وبعدين تعطى شهاده لكن الاكسبيرينس بيس لا 
انت في تيك بوكسز او في مجموعه كومبتنسيز ضروري انت تمشين بغض النظر خذيت سنتين او اربع سنوات وبمجرد ما تكمل القائمه بتاعك تعتبر كملت الكومبتنسي بيز بروجرام فيري كويك فيري كويك وورد اباوت ذا وورلد دايركتيف ميديكال سكولز Uh, basically, it has two components, so it, it, it takes on the contents of both um, directories, the Avicenna directory, which is, part, which is part of the WFME, and the World Directive Medical um, Education, FAMER. So both directories will be, or have been gathered into one. As you can see from the picture, both, uh, uh, both organizations are uh, represented. Uh, and uh, after 2024, so you can be registered today. So I think all the medical schools in Libya are registered on this website. Three minutes. Okay. Uh, so all the uh, universities and uh, uh, medical colleges in Libya are registered. But after 2024, you need to be accredited by a recognized body to be registered. So uh, this is the upcoming 2024. Uh, I'm sorry to put this in, uh, in Arabic. Because Dr. Adil insisted that this talk uh, needs to be in uh, in English. Um, sorry, Dr. Adil. So Libya and the history of the medical education. We put some of the names and some of the examples. There is Dr. Mohammed Aqf Baryoun. You can see him from the first time he studied the medical education from the Libyans. He came to Istanbul. He worked in Trabzon. Mohammed Al Fituri. عامل بين طرابلس وبنغازي وعد مواقع أخرى في الدولة العثمانية عارف عريف تقريبا الاسم دكتور عارف عريف توفى في 1935 عامل في شارع الزاوية وأيضا خارج ليبيا فيه دكتور محمد مسيك تخصص عيون من هو آخر هذا هم الأسماء اللي عندي أول كلية طب في بنغازي في عند تأسست في 1968 وبعدها كلية الطب في طرابلس 1973 ومن بعدها وصلنا إلى 19 كلية طب في سنة 2022 سو so, uh, معناها الأمور ممتازة جدا. Very brief and uh, very pragmatic take home messages. Uh, the history of medical education teaches us great lessons uh, and I hope I have conveyed some of them. We do not need to reinvent the wheel. Uh, other nations have committed the same mistakes, so we don't really need to go again and commit the same mistakes, and we must learn from other nations. These are my references.